Well, I'm really, I can't express how delighted I am to be back in Milledgeville. I was here in 2008 when I was doing research for this book. And in fact, the day that I was here, the, the mansion was closed, but Matt was kind enough to open it up for me and give me a private tour. So I'm especially happy um, to repay that favor by being here. And I'm also happy to see that apparently Sherman didn't steal all the silver in Georgia. <laughs> I've got a million Sherman related jokes. Um, <laughs> um, I also, I was just in Augusta last weekend and I will say that they're, um, they're sort of strangely disappointed that Sherman didn't come through <laughs> Augusta. They kept asking, well, why? Why didn't he, you know, why? So it's also, it's nice to be in a, in a place where, I mean, you, Milledgeville really experienced all of Sherman's march. So in the summer of 1963, John Lewis, mm -hmm. the recently elected chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, found himself writing the most important speech of his life. He would be speaking, along with a handful of other civil rights leaders, from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial as part of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Lewis wanted his speech to show the students frustration at the slow pace of change, to show anger, even militancy. And so he warned, the time will come when we will not confine our marching to Washington we will march through the South, through the heart of Dixie, the way Sherman did. We shall pursue our own scorched earth policy and burn Jim Crow to the ground nonviolently. 99 years after William Tecumseh Sherman led his 62,000 men out of Atlanta towards the sea and then up through the Carolinas, leaving devastation in their wake, the power of that event still resonated. 99 years later, the image of the march still angered, for at the last minute, Lewis was asked to remove that sentence, along with a few others that were seen as too inflammatory, from his speech. And he did. He literally made these changes in the shadow of the Lincoln statue, even as the beginning speeches were going on. Sherman's March. The name conjures up a, his, a host of images and references myths and metaphors for Americans. They think of Clark Gable and Vivian Lee, silhouetted against the flames and gone with the wind. Of lone chimneys, standing sentinel, all that remained of destroyed plantations. Of soldiers stealing hams and silver, chickens and jewelry. And finally, of war is hell and 40 acres and a mule, and of the birth of total war. That is Sherman, right? OK. <laughs> Sorry. It's, I can't see it, so I'm, you know. I, I argue in my book that Sherman's march was the most symbolically powerful aspect of the American Civil War. And it's one that's come to dominate our cultural understanding of the war. It stands for devastation and destruction, fire and brimstone, fighting war against civilians, and for the Civil War in a kind of microcosm. It's been memorialized in fiction and film. It's been used to explain America's involvement in Vietnam and one man's doomed search for romance. We've seen it used as a metaphor for the burned out South Bronx of the 1970s and the gerrymandered electoral district, that Georgia 11th, the Sherman's March district that briefly existed. Now, dozens and dozens of historians have written about various aspects of Sherman, Sherman's march, the military and the strategic, the impact that the war had on female civilians, the role the march played in sp spreading the news of emancipation, the lives of Sherman's soldiers, and of course, there are also dozens of biographies of William T. Sherman himself. What I do in Through the Heart of Dixie, Sherman's March and America's and American Memory is take a different approach. And so rather than simply retell the story of the march, this project explores the myriad ways in which Americans have remembered, retold, and reimagined Sherman's March. Even though the book title says American Memory, I kind of went back and forth with the publishers on that a lot, um, and I lost. But what, what I've really come to think about this project is that it's not so much about memory. Oftentimes when we talk about memory and historical memory, there's an implicit judgment 
There's this idea that there's what really happened and what people remember. And the idea is to unpack and figure out, well, where did it go wrong? That's not really what this book is about. I see this as a book about stories and storytelling. So I don't set out to say this story is true and this story is false. I'm much more interested in what the kinds of stories people tell show about what, what meaning the march had for them. So that I, it's much more about how stories are layered together than it is about one being right and another being wrong. And to that end, I take a variety of perspectives and approaches. I look at the march through the eyes of Southern civilians, Southern white civilians, through the eyes of African Americans. I look at how Sherman's veterans remembered the march. Um, dozens and dozens of travelers from the 1860s through the present day have retraced Sherman's march. There's often, particularly in the 20th century, a kind of element of self-discovery along with that. I look at how Sherman tried to shape his image after the war and how he came to be seen sometimes as the architect of Sherman of total war or condemned sometimes as a war criminal. I look at fiction and film. I look at music and poetry, photography, art, a really wide net. So let me give you a little bit of background. I feel like I probably don't need to do this in Milledgeville, but humor me. Um, it's the fall of 1864. It's late in the war. The Confederates are losing ground all over. Um, Grant's army and Lee's army are facing each other in the trenches outside of Petersburg, Virginia, just south of Richmond, kind of all those red arrows up at the top of the map. And then Sherman's army took control of Atlanta on September 2nd. Now, soon after he occupied Atlanta, Sherman decided to evacuate the city. He didn't want to have to deal with a civilian population. He wanted the city to be a purely military base. He doesn't want to have to feed people. He doesn't want to have to worry about spies or guerrilla attacks. And he doesn't want to have to leave any soldiers behind to hold on to the city of Atlanta. Um, when he is condemned for this in a letter from the mayor of Atlanta, this is when Sherman famously writes back, war is cruelty and you cannot refine it. And as a result, about 1,600 whites and probably several thousand African Americans are forced to pack up what they have and take the roads and the railroads also out of the city. His next plan, as you all well know, was to march across Georgia, the 285 miles to Savannah, to make Georgia, quote, howl, live off the land, and destroy everything that could aid the Confederacy. So this is a pretty broad schematic map of the march. You have the first phase, the march to the sea, and then the second phase, which runs up through the Carolinas and ends up outside of Durham. And my book deals with the entirety of the Georgia and Carolinas campaign. Sherman is finally given permission to do this. He has to convince Grant. He has to convince Lincoln. He's finally given permission and just before November 15th, his men burn and destroy everything of military value in the city, and the flames destroy the business district for Atlanta and about a third of the entire city. Sherman's army is about 62,000 men, 218 regiments, 52 alone from his home state of Ohio. They move in four parallel columns. Um, they're split into a right wing and a left wing, and then those are further subdivided. And the reason that I, I bring this up is because we often think of Sherman's march as kind of mowing everything down in its path, sort of cutting this 50-mile wide <laughs> lawnmower swath, right? It's not like that. It's, it's not 50 miles where everything is flattened. It's 50 miles from the furthest edge of one column to the very furthest edge of the fourth column. And so what I like to, to tell people, what I tell my students, what I tell everybody in these talks is don't think of it as a lawnmower. I like to think of Sherman's March more as rows of stitches. So the march goes through lots of places and causes lots of destruction, but there are lots of spaces that are untouched by the march. And I think these spaces matter. Um, there's very light and sporadic Confederate opposition. There's about 8,000 Confederate cavalry under Joseph Wheeler who are kind of chasing the march. 
Um, there's some skirmishing and, and fighting with companies of the Georgia State Militia as well. Before setting out, Sherman tried to set some ground rules. His special field orders number 120 ordered his men to forage liberally on the country and to destroy mills, houses, cotton gins, etc., but within limits. The foraging parties were supposed to be regularized under the control of specific officers. Soldiers were not supposed to enter homes. If the army came onto a piece of property and were left unmolested, they were also supposed to leave the property there alone. Now significantly, Sherman also ordered that when seizing livestock, his men were to discriminate between, now this is Sherman's language, between the rich, who are usually hostile, and the poor and industrious, usually neutral or friendly. So I think there's this interesting class dimension that Sherman tries to interject. As for African Americans, it's important to keep in mind Sherman is no abolitionist, not by a long shot. There are no African American troops in Sherman's army, and that is because Sherman would not permit them. It's very controversial on his part. Um, so as for African Americans, Sherman's willing to allow his commanders to put able-bodied men in, who could, as Sherman put it, be of service into a pioneer court, working as teamsters, things like that. But he does not want to have to support women and children. And so he wants also, as these foraging parties to go through, they can announce emancipation, but then they're supposed to try to encourage African Americans to stay, to stay behind. Now, most of these rules are honored more in the breach than in reality, but I think their existence is important. I think it gives Sherman, and, and even to a degree his men, a degree of, of moral cover. And I also think they allow for a lot of elasticity. So, and you see a lot of this elasticity in stories of the march, right? Some places are treated leniently, some places are treated harshly. The men march out of Atlanta on November 15th. Sherman initially travels with the left wing. On November 21st, the men of the right wing fought one of the few true battles of the Georgia campaign at Griswoldville, right nearby, as you all, I'm sure, know. On November 22nd, the men marched into Milledgeville, Georgia's capital, and they were cheered by African Americans in town, welcomed much less warmly by the remaining civilians. Um, as you know, Joe Brown had fled, and the legislature had fled in advance. Um, Joe Brown also cleared out most of the furniture from the mansion, along with taking He's said to have only taken cabbages. I do very vividly recall Matt Davis telling me, no, no, he took all the vegetables. <laughs> so, <laughs> he took all the food with him. <laughs> the relationship between, enslaved, uh, between slaves and Sherman's men is a really complicated one, as I sort of indicated. Um, they're greeted as liberators on the one hand. They are, in fact, the greatest army of liberation in the Civil War. I, I tried to calculate. It's impossible to calculate how many African Americans they freed. Um, the only way I could think to calculate it was I knew all the counties Sherman's March went through. I went back to the 1860 census. I added up the enslaved population in all these counties. and I, I mean, they conceivably could have come in contact with somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 to 450,000 African Americans lived in the counties that the march went through. So it's a lot of people. Um, certainly about 25,000 African Americans wind up following Sherman through Georgia, and we can assume it's a similar number in South Carolina and North Carolina. Officers and soldiers hire them on as cooks and porters. But there are also tragedies. African American women are sexually assaulted in greater numbers, we think, than white women were. Slave cabins are ransacked and destroyed. Enslaved people's food is taken as well. Um, among the followers, babies died, children and, and adults drowned crossing Ebenezer Creek outside of Savannah when um, a Union commander ordered the pontoon bridges pulled up. So maybe 7,000 of this 25,000 made it all the way to the coast with Sherman. How much devastation was there on the march? Mm, Sherman estimated for the Georgia section $100 million. And again, we can assume probably similar numbers for South Carolina and North Carolina. One soldier described it, the campaign this way. We had a gay old campaign destroyed all we could not eat, 
stole their Negroes, burned their cotton and gin, spilled their sorghum, burned and twisted their railroads, and raised hell generally. Their stories of men boiling coffee over fires made of Confederate money. My favorite story, actually, of the Georgia portion of the march is, is actually in Millersville, where um, Union soldiers went into the legislative chamber and had their own mock legislative session where they brought Georgia back into the Union. I think it's sort of fascinating that they don't do anything about emancipation. I think that's very telling, actually, of where sort of these men's head were, were, was. Um, and then they ransacked the state library as well. The problem is of these unauthorized bummers. What Sherman's men take bummer, which had been really an epithet, meaning kind of a skulker or someone who's a little morally suspect, they take it on as this badge of pride. Um, and they are really responsible for a lot of devastation. And there's a big debate at the time and, and ongoing, sort of the degree to which these bummers were under control or not. Um, they arrive outside of Savannah on December 10th. They find the city defended by 10,000 Confederates. Sherman bypasses it temporarily. He captures Fort McAllister and reopens his communications because it's also important to keep in mind that no one in the North really knows what's going on for this month. Um, there's sort of sporadic news coming out, but it's very sketchy. <coughs> Excuse me. Savannah earns the enmity of its fellow Southerners by ultimately deciding to surrender to Sherman rather than allow itself to be destroyed. And on November 22nd, Sherman very famously sends a telegraph to Abraham Lincoln. I beg to present you as a Christmas gift, the city of Savannah with 150 guns uh, and plenty of ammunition and also 25,000 bales of cotton. And it sets off this wave of Northern euphoria. Sherman and his men spend the month of January in Savannah, and then they move out of the city and up through the swamps of South Carolina. There, the Union veterans vent their anger on the place that they believed began the Civil War. And Sherman, in his memoirs, recalls it this way. He's very disingenuous, I think. Somehow, somehow, somehow our men had got the idea that South Carolina was the cause of all our troubles. Her people were the first to fire on Fort Sumter and had been in a great hurry to precipitate the country into civil war, and therefore on them should fall the scourge of war in its worst form. I saw and felt that we would not be able any longer to restrain our men as we had done in Georgia, and I would not restrain the army lest its vigor and energy should be impaired. And this is really all too true. Most of the damage in Georgia was really confined to barns and gin houses, smoke houses, chicken coops. There are not a lot of, of homes were actually destroyed in Georgia. There were some, but there's a lot of Annabella mansions still left in Georgia. So um, they really attack many more private homes in South Carolina. Uh, one soldier wrote to his wife that the men burned everything they could in South Carolina, not under orders, but in spite of orders. The men had it in for South Carolina and took it out in their own way. They arrive at the state capital of Columbia on February 16th, 1865. Sherman and his men have long been charged with burning the city. Sherman, in turn, blamed Wade Hampton and the Confederates who set fire to cotton before they retreated. Um, my opinion is that everybody burned it. Wade Hampton and his men started a fire, and, and Sherman and his men did very little to try to put those fires out. And, and the end result, of course, is that the city burns. From Columbia, the men then march up through South Carolina and into North Carolina, a state to which they were supposed to be more favorably disposed. They were supposed to see North Carolina as full of unionists, they're supposed to treat it more gently. Um, eh, a little bit, but not perhaps as much as they were, they were asked to do. At this point, if you haven't sort of kept this mental map straight in your head, <laughs> what Sherman is doing is he's trying to get to Richmond. He's trying to get up to Petersburg to join up with Grant. Um, there are two main battles fought in North Carolina. Averisboro and Bentonville are fought. 
in March. They slow the progress of the march, but they don't stop it by any means. On April 13th, the marchers stride into Raleigh. If you've been keeping track, this is their third state capital that they've taken control of. And on April 17th, at the Bennett Farmhouse, Sherman and Johnston begin negotiations for peace. And Sherman wants a soft peace, including a general amnesty. And he has reason to believe that this will be approved because he had met in March with Grant and Lincoln and sort of hashed this out. The problem, of course, if you have your Civil War calendar going in your head, is that on April 17th, Abraham Lincoln is dead. And in this very charged climate following the Lincoln assassination, um, these terms are rejected. And finally, Sherman and Johnston meet on April 26th, and they sign terms identical to those at Appomattox. And then I do follow the marchers briefly. They, the march doesn't end there. Um, they actually go all the way up to Washington, D.C. to participate in the grand review of the Union armies on May 23rd and 24th, 1865. So this is the problem. I always take a really long time to retell the basic contours of the march. What I want to do now is talk a little bit about the kinds of stories that people tell and give you a sense of the, the way that I look at these stories and, and the genres of stories that I tell. So the first is, just make sure. Oh, somehow I'm behind. That's the Bennett place. OK, that's where I want to be. Um, the easiest kind of story to find, frankly, are stories of devastation and destruction. And one of the most often quoted incidents comes from the diary of Dolly Lent Burge, who lived near Covington, Georgia. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with this diary. She frantically prepared for the arrival of the marchers. What shall I do? Where to go? She lamented on the night of November 17th. But the following day, she sprang into action. She arranged for her livestock to be hidden. She buried a barrel of salt in the garden of one of her enslaved women's home. And she packed up her clothes in case she needed to flee. On November 19th, as the first Union soldiers approached, she steeled her nerves, told her slaves to hide, and walked out, as she said, to claim protection and a guard. To her dismay, like demons they rush in. My yards are full. To my smokehouse, my dairy, pantry, kitchen, and cellar, like famished wolves, they come, breaking locks and whatever is in their way. The thousand pounds of meat in my smokehouse is gone in a twinkling. My flour, my meal, my lard, butter, eggs, pickles of various kinds, both in vinegar and brine, my 18 fat turkeys, my hens, chickens, and fowls, my young pigs are shot down in my yard and hunted as if they were the rebels themselves. One of the things I want you to notice about this is how much food she had. <laughs> That's why Sherman is marching through Georgia. Because this is an area that has been relatively untouched by the war. And this is an area with a lot of food. And this is food that can feed Sherman's army. And this is food that if it goes to feed Sherman's army is not going to feed the Confederate army. So it's really crucial that, I mean, this is why. This is why they're there. Her remaining livestock, her horses, her mules, the pigs they didn't shoot, are rounded up, and her young male slaves, she calls them her boys, were forced to leave along with the army. Soldiers took her money, they took her clothing, they took her coffee pots and flour sifters, her ovens, her skillets, all were seized. Now, all of this is happening also, even though Burgess Plantation is nominally being guarded. Um, in one of these weird coincidences, some of the soldiers who came on the plantation actually knew Burgess' brother, who lived in Chicago. They actually helped keep her home safe. For some, one group of soldiers torched her cotton as they left, but these other soldiers put the fire out and kept the house safe. And the following morning, she fixed breakfast for her guards. She used their coffee ration in her tea kettle, since they'd stolen her coffee pots. At last, they all passed by, as she wrote, leaving her poorer by $30,000 and a much stronger rebel. And for all the terror that Burge endured, she really probably fared better than a lot of her neighbors. She still had managed to hide, managed to hide some food. She still had some potatoes. She had flour. She had syrup. She still had some meat. 
a couple of her cows wandered home in the days following um, the march, and uh, she actually found a still edible carcass of one of her hogs left near her family's graveyard. One of the reasons I like this story is that it is more complex than just a recitation of horrors. She's guarded, sort of. She retains some food. Her outbuildings in her home are not destroyed. And, and what I think is important about this is it shows that these interactions between marchers and Southern whites are very dependent on the kind of individual moments and the individual people involved. They're often fraught, but they also often involve small kindnesses. And homes and property are spared for a variety of reasons. Um, Masonic emblems, lots and lots of homes saved by putting a Masonic apron on the door, something like that. Pretty girls who lived there now. Uh, pretty girls who Sherman had been in love with in the 1840s, <laughs> either one. Um, you know, someone runs out the door yelling, smallpox, smallpox, and the soldiers run away. Um, <laughs> another story that you see here a lot of is, is women hide their jewelry or hide their wallets by shoving them in their baby's diapers. No man's going in there. <laughs> um, things like that. But, but what, what, what the point of these stories, or what I argue about these stories, is the reason there are so many of these stories is actually because there's a lot of things that survived. A lot of homes were spared. A lot of property was saved. And, and you need a reason. You need to, to explain this. Now, for their part, Sherman's marchers rarely stressed their role as destroyers on the route of the march. Let me just make sure that changed. <laughs> Um, occasionally they'll talk about destroying something um, sort of in letters and diaries and, and contemporary recollections, um, but in their post-war memoirs and speeches they almost never do. What they tend to do is destroy, is describe the march as very pleasant. It's this kind of fun interlude for them. It's like a picnic. They are not marching very fast. They're marching about 10 miles a day when normally they could be expected to march 20. They have a lot to eat, and no one is shooting at them, which is all really good, good for them. Um, item, had my first drink of milk since the 26th of December, 1863, wrote Charles Wright Willis of the 103rd Illinois on November 15th. Subsequent diary entries of his noted the unusually wide variety of fare available to soldiers, eggs, pork, potatoes, peach brandy, a possum. Um, <laughs> And, and when soldiers described their interactions with Southern civilians, they really seem to emphasize the positive. And I'm going to just give you two anecdotes to see how they spun these stories around. And also, this, okay, this is probably my all-time favorite image of the march. This is a painting by Thomas Nast called The Halt, a stop on the Georgia campaign. And I love it because it is the most sanitized thing ever. <laughs> right? I mean... I think we can all agree it probably wasn't like this. And yet this is how Nast wants to portray these interactions. So, in that spirit, uh, the first one comes from a guy named Fred Reitz, who's a member of the 21st Wisconsin. He and his, his companions came across a young Southern couple in a small home in South Carolina, and the husband was actually home on furlough. He'd been wounded at Petersburg. So this is what Reitz wrote. To show you that even Sherman's bummers respected the soldier who was manfully fighting us in the front, he recalled with evident satisfaction, I will say that nothing had been disturbed around his little home. Even his chickens were left untouched. The soldiers then go and they bring some food to supplement what the couple had, although Reitz never says where that food came from. No. And he said, the pretty wife cooked a large meal at union request. <laughs> we had a very enjoyable dinner together. And when we left in the afternoon, the young couple had a much better idea of Sherman's Yankees. I would love to know the other side of that story. <laughs> I just, you wonder, right? Here's a, a similar, in a sort of similar vein. This comes from a guy named Charles Belknap, who becomes a sort of professional bummer. He gives a lot of these speeches. This is, again, pretty late in the march. He and his men came across a woman who was about to give birth. The Yankees fetch a neighbor, and they help to care for the woman through the night until her son was born. And he, he has this scene that in the morning, he found this grizzled old veteran softly crooning a lullaby to the baby. This is like a nice scene. It's very Thomas Nast, the halt. 
But then, we christened that one with a canteen of Applejack and named him Billy Sherman and took for our reward the family carriage loaded with dead pigs, some corn and chickens, and other things necessary to the conduct of the army. So it's pretty safe to assume that the mother's going to rename the baby, right? I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I never looked in the census, but I I'm going to go with that. But what I find fascinating and confusing about this story is that Belknap and his men, they take all this time and care to make sure that the woman is OK, that the baby is OK. And then they take all her food and leave her starving and destitute. And this, this uh, disconnect doesn't really seem to occur to Belknap. So this kind of intertwined cruelty and kindness also appears in interactions between Union soldiers and African Americans. And I, I can give, I have an entire chapter about African Americans. I, um, they're liberators, and yet they're uncomfortable with that role. And African Americans are, are very um, cognizant of that. And, and one of those sources I draw on is, for all their flaws, are the WPA narratives taken down in the 1930s. And there's about 70 or 75 people who mention Sherman's march pretty explicitly, where, where you can tell from the places and that they're talking about Sherman and Sherman's <laughs> march. Um, and one of the ones I, I think is the most interesting comes from a man named Claiborne Moss. He lived, he said, on the Duggins Plantation, about 15 miles from Sandersville, Georgia. When the march comes through, Moss recognized one of the men in, in Sherman's March, one of the men in Union uniform, as a guy named Cooper Cock, who had been a peddler, who had then joined up with the Union Army. And what Moss says is that Cuck kind of hangs back. He's afraid he's going to get recognized. And then when the majority of soldiers have passed by, Cuck and a friend, and now this is Moss's language, came back and stole everything that they could lay their hands on, all the gold and silver that was in the house, and everything they could carry. Then Moss goes on, and he recalls that they had to feed Union officers who spent the night there, and he was angry. He said they didn't pay nothing for what they was fed. And then they took every horse and mule we had. When the marchers moved on, they also took Moss's uncle with them. And the, took is Moss's language. So we don't know if his uncle, whose name was Ben, we don't know if his uncle went of his own accord or not. We do know this, and then this again comes from Claiborne Moss. They got in a fight. They gave Uncle Ben five horses, five sacks of silverware, and five saddles. The goods was taken in the fight. Uncle Ben brought it back with him. The boss took all that silver away from him. Uncle Ben didn't know what to do with it. The Yankees had taken all my masters and he took Ben's. Ben gave it back to him. He come back cause he wanted to. So we're left really to wonder, I find this, this, this so powerful. You just wonder what, what Claiborne Moss's uncle thought of all of this, right? The Yankees steal from the planters. They give their ill-gotten gains, the silver and the saddles and all of this, to Ben, presumably for some kind of safekeeping. Ben comes home, and then Ben's master steals them from him. It's just baffling and, and, and so complicated. I know I keep saying that, but, um, and Ben too seems to have fallen in with that population of African Americans who chose to stay with the devil they knew, to stay with their former masters, to stay where they were from, rather than take their chances following along on the march. I could go on and, and on with stories like this. Um, as I said earlier, I look at music, I look at poetry, did that change? There we go. I look at music and poetry, I look at film and literature. Um, it's, it's, I, I think it's pretty rich, there's a lot in there. Um, what I've also done, and I really encourage you, is also to explore the website that I have that goes along with this, called Sherman's March in America Mapping Memory. It's at shermansmarch.org, or if you Google me, it'll come up. Um, I've been working on this now for several years um, in conjunction with a professor of visual arts at UMBC. And what we are trying to do is make a lot of these stories and these conflicting narratives visible. So there's five different maps that you can trace Sherman's March from different perspectives. You can see it from the perspective of veterans or 
um, of travel accounts. You can see fictional places. Um, and we're doing it through a series of, of vignettes. There's um, Some of them are just one or two paragraphs. Some of them are full three minute animations. And actually the story I just told you, the Claiborne Moss story, um, a visual arts student made a really great film of it. So it's in there. We're hoping to finish it. Okay, I'm not gonna lie to you. We're not gonna finish it by November 15th. <laughs> We're probably about 70% of the way there. <laughs> and then um, there's also, starting on November 15th, uh, there's gonna be a day-by-day -day blog tracing Sherman's March as it goes for the, the six months where each day you can come back and there's a little paragraph of a story from somebody. So that is gonna, gonna be pretty current. I can tell you that November 17th I am using um, Dolly Bird. Oh no, I'm not, I don't think I am using her. Anyway, um, I have done the first few days. <laughs> so I, uh, I encourage you to take a look at that as well. And thank you all very much for coming.